Hi, my name is George Hobach. Welcome to my new talk about Einstein's true legacy, which of course is local symmetry and symmetry means sameness. Einstein was able to demonstrate that the local laws of nature are the same everywhere and all the time. And by doing so, he also demonstrated that local symmetry is actually nature's core principle, which also means that local symmetry is the same everywhere and all the time in nature. And at the beginning, I want to give you two quotes to highlight why it is important that everybody knows about local symmetry. The first quote comes from the book Symmetry and the Beautiful Universe by Leon Ledermann and Christopher Hill. They are both noted physicists. Ledermann is also a Nobel Prize laureate. And in the book they write, the perspectives offered by symmetry, it is imperative that we try to give the non-scientific members of society who through democratic processes make the final decisions a better understanding of the key issues. In fact, our future depends on it. And Einstein in the foreword to Lincoln Barnett's book, The Universe and Dr. Einstein, he wrote, it is of greatest importance that the general public be given an opportunity to experience consciously and intelligently the efforts and results of scientific research. Restricting the body of knowledge to a small group detains the philosophical spirit of a people and leads to spiritual poverty. We don't want this to happen, right? So, today I'm also going to focus on the concept of infinity, the field and consciousness, and I will examine how this is related to local symmetry. But let's first take a look at the local symmetry concept itself. At the center you can see the equal sign, so this tells you right away that local symmetry is a purely mathematical concept. And I put these two magnets on either side of the equal sign to demonstrate that they are identical, they are the same, they are symmetric. And saying this really is the first level of local symmetry. This level is time and space independent because it does not matter for sameness uh, what time it is or, or where you are. Uh, because sameness needs to stay the same, otherwise if changes were to occur it wouldn't be sameness. And Einstein was very much aware of the fact that local symmetry is central. That's why eventually he wanted to call his theory uh, invariance theory, because invariance is a technical term that means local symmetry. And since this is a purely mathematical concept, you can also label these two magnets, the first and the second, and then you can also remove these material objects and then you're left with this equation here, which tells you that the first is equal to the second, or one equals two. And this opens up the view onto the second level of local symmetry, which is that of a dynamic relationship. It's the action level, because you can move back and forth between these two numbers. And this order here, the sequence, also tells us that there's generally a direction of motion, of development, and of action. And this uh, local symmetry concept really is the central principle of nature. So you can imagine that there's a lot of data compression involved for local symmetry to be able to underpin and create everything. So this short code here may not mean to you a lot because it's so abstract. But the uh, sequence here tells us how we can derive properties so that we can open up this short code and read it like a book. And uh, we have to just relate these two numbers to each other, then they start talking and we get a better idea of what local symmetry is all about. So let's do this. If we relate number one to number two, we will come to the conclusion that number one is the smaller number. It is the smallest whole integer number. So number one represents small and this opens up number one property space. Small also means local, because uh, when you're small, you're confined to a concise region. And this then tells you this aspect of locality, why symmetry is local and why the laws of nature are local as well, because the laws of nature are also relationship concepts. And since we have this clear order and sequence here, we have to highlight um, that symmetry really is local in order to understand how this uh, fundamental principle plays out in nature. If we continue deriving properties, we get from small to concentration. Concentration gives us the notion of a unit, of unity. And if you want to sum up these terms here, you can, in, mathematical uh, in a mathematical fashion, you can call this property space added up. 
if you move over to number two and relate number two to number one, you will come to the conclusion that number two is the larger number, it's the additional number. The mathematical notion of additionality does not have any limits, so it represents infinity. And infinity then, of course, is open uh, like a book, uh, like the future, and uh, like something mysterious simply because you cannot pin a number on infinity. A colloquial version of the uh, mathematical term additionality is the word more. More implies action, and action, of course, is energy. And uh, energy really is the ability to do work, and when you do work, you do more. You always do this against a resistance, and the resistance would be this added up concept here. More also means counting. One marker, one more, one more, so that's one, two, three. It's not very difficult. And um, energy, of course, is also creativity because it allows you to do things. And since number two property space here is located um, or is the part of the equation that refers back to number one, we can understand that the concept of the return is located in number two property space as well as the uh, mathematical equivalent, which is the term adding up. And uh, now, where does the concept of the field come from? It's easy to see on in number one property space we have the concept of unity. In number two property space we have the term or infinity term. And if you combine them, you get a wholeness that does not have a limit. And that's the, the field version. Okay, and uh, then the question is, where does the aspect of consciousness come from? It's also encoded here in the local symmetry structure, because these two uh, aspects here, number one and number two, they are due to the equal sign aware of each other. And the equal sign tells us that these aspects even though individually they may look differently, but uh, the equal sign tells us that they are the same. So this is a constitution of self-awareness. And since the equal sign makes this a wholeness system, the system as a whole then is consciousness. So this is all uh, encoded here in this local symmetry structure. And uh, we have derived several properties. And in previous talks, I illustrated um, how you can derive, uh, for instance, all these features that we have discovered so far about the universe, be it space-time, gravity, or quantum mechanics. You can look it up in these talks. And now we are ready to dive into this concept of infinity, the field, and consciousness. And um, I want to discuss several categories, starting with infinity, the mysterious space-time, and we will always analyze how infinity plays out in these uh, different categories here. Then we come to the concept of the field in consciousness. Eventually we will take a look at science and then we will analyze consequences of our discussion here. But let's first start with the infinity concept and I want to give you a quote by a famous mathematician, David Hilbert. He was a contemporary of Einstein and um, the quote comes from the book To Infinity and Beyond by Elie Meyer. And uh, Hilbert says, No other question has ever moved so profoundly the spirit of man. No other idea has so fruitfully stimulated his intellect. Yet no other concept stands in greater need of clarification than that of the infinite. And I first want to discuss again in a different way how infinity is incorporated into this local symmetry concept. If you take a look at the symmetry equation, local symmetry equation, you can see here up, up here, you can see that number two can see itself as a unit, but number two can also refer back to number one and then the whole uh, local symmetry equation is one unit itself. And we then know that this unit actually contains two units or two aspects. And so we can understand that each unit automatically always becomes or represents two units. I illustrated this here. We have number two as one unit. It splits up in these two other blue units. And then this blue unit 
I illustrated splits up again into these green units here. And so you know that uh, the local symmetry equation instantly explodes into infinity. Um, given that local symmetry, as we know from the sameness level, is space and time independent, you also know that infinity in, a, in an eternal fashion is always part of uh, the local symmetry concept. And this then gives you the eternal mathematical world because infinity contains everything. I explained in a previous talk that it contains all numbers, it contains all mathematical operations and geometry, so you can look it up. I just wanted to highlight again that local symmetry uh, contains the mathematical world in an eternal fashion. I also want to highlight that local symmetry gives us the concept of quantity because you have these numbers so we can measure, we can quantify, but it also gives us the concept of quality because every unit, like the uh, overall unit of local symmetry we know, contains infinity. Infinity is open, it cannot be pinned down with a concrete number, you, you cannot control it, so there's always something radiating, something <clears throat> that is larger than this unity concept. And this is what we can stand, understand as quality, it's more uh, an emotional sensation, that's how we can perceive it. And now we want to move over to the concept of the mysterious, which is also, I would argue, based on the infinity concept, because infinity is open, so there is always something that we do not know, and this is mysterious. And I want to start off this category by quoting Albert Einstein from his book What I Believe, and with respect to the mysterious, he said, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead, his eyes are closed. The insight into the mystery of life has also given rise to religion. That's what I listed here. The mysterious is the source of religion, art and science. Religion uh, refers us back to the mysterious concept in a wholeness form. Art relies on the concept of quality and science, of course, on quantity. And this all comes out of local symmetry, where infinity plays an essential role. And of course, as I have uh, indicated before, since infinity is open, you cannot compute everything, so this also uh, underpins why there is something mysterious. And since this uh, aspect here, the mysterious, uh, leads us to both the immaterial world, which is located in the realm of religion, as well as analyzing the material world, we somehow need to find a, a, a few on all this that unites everything. And this is also why physicists always point out that uh, physics uh, is actually philosophy. And I want to give you a quote by Ledermann and Hill from their book Beyond the God Particle. They say physics is the ultimate philosophy about nature and reality. And we can understand why, because physics, thanks to Einstein, has revealed this holistic principle that is all encompassing as it uh, contains infinity. So Max Planck, for instance, also a noted physicist, a Nobel Prize laureate, um, he said the following, and this is from the archive of the history of the Max Planck Society. So Planck said, not the visible but perishable matter is the real thing, the truth, reality, but the invisible immortal spirit is the only truth. That way the physicist, whose job it is to deal with matter, transitions from the realm of matter into the realm of the spirit. And thus our mission comes to an end and we need to pass on our research into the hand of philosophers. And again, this goes uh, to the point that I've just made that we need to unify these different aspects, the material and immaterial world. And we will get to this uh, more closely when we talk about fields and consciousness. But before we get there, we need to take a quick look at space-time and to, to realize how infinity plays out there and how central this is too. 
And I will start off with a quote from Frank Wilczek. He's also a noted physicist and Nobel Prize laureate. And this comes from his book, The Lightness of Being. And Wilczek says that physically natural version of symmetry is called local symmetry. Local symmetry is a much bigger assumption than the alternative global symmetry. For local symmetry is an enormous collection of separate symmetries. Roughly speaking, a separate symmetry for each point of space and time. Each place and moment defines therefore its own symmetry. Because local symmetry is a much bigger assumption than global symmetry, it imposes more restrictions on the equations or in other words on the form of physical law. Now what uh, Wilczek is telling us is that really, as I indicated, every a moment in time and every little reference frame in space is underpinned by local symmetry and represents local symmetry. So you really get infinitely many event points, if you will, that are representing local symmetry because local symmetry contains infinity to be this general principle. And interestingly, local symmetry is, he says, much bigger than the alternative global symmetry and this comes from the fact that local symmetry has this sequence here, this harm harmony statement that includes infinity. So when you follow nature's rule and accept that local is on place number one, you also get uh, the infinity concept. Whereas if you go global first, which means you take number two and put it on position number one, then you're destroying the entire harmony and local symmetry concept and this doesn't really work out well. And local symmetry is also the bigger concept because it helps define how the laws of nature have to be and how everything is interconnected so that it works out in a harmonious fashion. And of course it has the infinity term in its toolkit so it can really be creative and, and valid everywhere and all the time, infinitely many times. And then also Frank Wilczek in his book Light, The Lightness of Being says, our deepest understanding of reality requires many qubits at each point in space and time. The world is a tremendous multiple infinity of qubits. The space which we must use to describe our world brings in infinities of infinities. Now if you take a look up here, the local symmetry equation contains or consists of two aspects that are integrated into a unit and this is really equivalent to the definition of the core of information which is the bit that contains two bit values and on the quantum mechanical level these two bit values are active simultaneously and Wilczek informs us that on the smallest scale we will find infinitely many uh, qubits and as I said, a qubit is a local symmetry representation. So when you zoom down, you find local symmetry uh, in infinite number. So you can really see that infinity is part of local symmetry. So now we can move over to the field concept. And, and at the beginning, I explained that the, the notion of the field also uh, derives or is encoded in this local symmetry structure here. I want to give you, to open up this category, a quote by Albert Einstein and Leopold Infeld from their book The Evolution of Physics and they say, field being the only reality, which really means local symmetry being the only reality. And the field, since it is also based on local symmetry, <coughs> uh, comes with this equation 1 equals 2. But we know from our discussion that local symmetry really has these two levels, the sameness level and the action level. And the sameness level is time and space independent, so we can already derive that there must be a field which is eternal, space and time independent. And I've already alluded to the eternal mathematical world, so there must be two types of fields. The other field must be the action field here, which is the second level of local symmetry. And I would argue that the action level, this action field, is what we are used to because this is based uh, or interconnected with the material world. And um, we also need to remember that this local symmetry equation here uh, represents self-awareness and consciousness. 
And now I want to discuss how this plays out in the concept of the field. I want to start with the action field because that's what we're used to. And I want to give you a quote by a famous physicist, Bruce Shum, from his book Deep Down Things. And he says, quantum field theory takes the notion one step further, asserting that the fields themselves are quantized. And he gives the example of the electromagnetic field, which he says is an assemblage, assemblage of photons. Now, what does this mean? Um, the particle concept comes here from number one, property space. Here we have the notion of the unit. Number two, property space, we have the concept of energy. And it was Max Planck who discovered that um, energy is quantized, comes in smallest units. Actually, there's a smallest constant unit, unit which he called H. Uh, small means, of course, local and constant means that something is always the same, so it represents symmetry. In other words, the smallest constant unit of energy, or the quanta in general, represent local symmetry, so they also represent self-awareness and consciousness. And they, they come with these two levels, sameness, constancy, and action, energy. So they also represent the equal sign. And that's how we can understand that this field, this infinity term, that is connected to this unity concept, so we have a wholeness that is infinite, that is open, consists of these little quanta, these uh, flashes of self-awareness, and they can unite because of the equal sign that they also represent. And so we come to the conclusion, really, that the field concept is a representation of consciousness, and it is very crucial also to understand that, for instance, two particles, like two electrons, when they interact via photons, they interact via the local symmetry equation two, and this is then also self-awareness and consciousness. So the entire universe is a representation of awareness, self-awareness and consciousness that is developing. And since we now have discussed the action field, we can conclude that there is also a field that is space and time independent where, so to speak, the entire information is located. Okay, and I want to give you now two more, uh, one more quote with respect to these small particles. This comes from Werner Heisenberg, and it is uh, he is quoted in the book Quantum Questions, edited by Ken Wilber, and uh, Heisenberg says, I think that on this point modern physics has definitely decided for Plato, for the smallest units of matter in fact not, uh, are, not, are in fact not physical objects in the ordinary sense of the word, they are forms, structures or in Plato's sense ideas, which can be unambiguously spoken of only in the language of mathematics. Democritus and Plato both had hoped that in the smallest units of matter they would find the one, the unitary principle that governs the course of the world. Plato was convinced that this principle can be expressed and understood only in the mathematical form. And that's what I've been describing, that this uh, quantum concept represents the entire local symmetry equation and self-awareness and consciousness. And then this also applies to the field in, in general. And so it should not be a surprise then, for instance, that Max Planck in an interview in The Observer 1930 once said the following, I regard consciousness as fundamental, I regard matter as derivative from consciousness, we cannot get behind consciousness, everything that we talk about, everything that we regard as existing postulates consciousness, and we've just been discussing this. And uh, Roger Penrose, uh, also a famous physicist and Nobel Prize Lord in his book, The Emperor's New Mind says, all the information was there all the time. It was just a matter of putting things together and seeing the answer. This is very much in accordance with Plato's own idea that say mathematical discovery is just a form of remembering. And this um, alludes again to the sameness level, this time and space independent world where the information is hosted, so to speak, and this is the mathematical world in a way, but it's also more 
Penrose goes on to say, there is much mystery and beauty as one might wish in the precise platonic mathematical world and most of this mystery resides with the concepts that lie outside the comparatively limited part of where algorithms and computation reside. And this is very uh, interesting and worthwhile pondering about because what Penrose tells us is that in this um, upper level that is space and time independent we have the mathematical world but due to the infinity term not everything can get computed and so there is a, a really large part which contains ideas and, and concepts that lie outside this uh, um, realm where we, we, we can use algorithms and computation and so it's important to respect this infinity term that you cannot control everything. And there's really also a real-world example. It comes from mathematical biology. Andreas Wagner is a mathematical biologist. He has a great team and he comes from the uh, University of Zurich. And in his book, Arrival of the Fittest, he describes the following. The mathematics of biology allowed us to see that these libraries, and he refers to libraries containing genotype text. Genotype text really tell you how uh, genes can get constituted the amazing possibilities. And so he says these libraries self-organize with a simple principle, a simple, as simple as the gravitation that helps small diffuse matter into enormous galaxies. This principle that organisms are robust, a consequence of the complexity that helps them survive in a changing world, brings forth the intricate organization of these vast libraries. The libraries are, of course, on the eternal sameness level. And the principle that he mentions has two basic elements, robustness and complexity. And robustness is another word for being uh, added up, for being stable. This is number one property space. Complexity, of course, comes from number two property space, which contains infinity. And so the organisms are based on this local symmetry equation and the, the upper level, the space and timeless uh, libraries, they are also organized based on this. So you can really see that these two levels exist. And of course, since they both based on the local symmetry equation, they can communicate. And this is for me personally uh, very exciting to, to grasp. And so Einstein in his letter to Phyllis, Phyllis is a young girl, in 1936 wrote, everyone who is seriously involved in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that a spirit is manifest in the laws of the universe, a spirit vastly superior to that of man. And of course, infinity is this vastness. And now we want to move over to science and see how important infinity is there. I want to start off with one simple quote by Henri Poincaré. He's a mathematician, he was also a uh, contemporary of Einstein, and this is from his book Science and Hypothesis. And in it, uh, Poincaré says, the idea of mathematical infinity is already playing a pre preponderating part, and without it there would be no science at all, because there would be nothing general. Okay, this is again the infinity term, which is all-inclusive, and this allows you to be general. That, that's why local symmetry is the most general or abstract and hence mathematical statement about the world but these uh, laws these laws of nature that we have discovered they are also valid for infinitely many event points in space-time so they in these laws infinity is also included and it's kind of interesting to note that even though these laws are ma mathematical and rather exact they also contain the infinity term which lies beyond computation, but we need infinity in order to make general statements. So science really relies on the infinity term. And the laws are, as I said, then general. They are abstract because it's all mathematical. They are simple because at the center you always have the equal sign, which is uh, the, the, the center, again, of local symmetry. And they are based on relationships because that's also the structure of, of symmetry. And what science points to really is that the universe is knowable, which is a feature of consciousness. And it's knowable because we always have the local symmetry concept everywhere and all the time. So we can always recognize what is going on. And local symmetry 
for instance via the constant uh, light speed which is a local symmetric dynamic law organizes the whole universe in a unified interconnected fashion that ensures that local symmetry is maintained okay and so science really leads us to this understanding that consciousness is fundamental in for for reality <clears throat> and this then leads us to the last category the last column here which is that we want to analyze a few consequences of all that infinity unfortunately can also be negative um, it can destroy cycles can destroy balance harmony and how does this happen it happens when we put global first okay global seems like a big idea but Frank Wilczek has uh, illustrated to us in his quote that the big idea is local symmetry and when you put global first you're destroying this whole relationship concept and you're starting to wanting to control or ignore the local aspect the local aspect gives you the un unit concept which is important to realize infinity you're also um, becoming very small minded in the way so you're cutting yourself off from infinity especially if you want to rely on on mathematics and algorithms only that's not a good idea and then infinity becomes destructive because the wholeness system uh, be becomes separated in itself and then things start to to unravel and it uh, creates a lot of chaos and instability which we can of course call negative infinity on the other hand if you stick to the local symmetry concept and this cycles right back to the beginning where Liedermann in Hill said it's so important that everybody knows about local sy symmetry because if you understand this concept you can be much more in harmony with this overall system with nature that we are part of and then you're also uh, connected to your spirituality your consciousness uh, will evolve and grow um, you're overall a more positive holistic thinking person your feelings will be more positive which is also very important and of course um, you get a better understanding of this concept of freedom which is directly linked to the infinity term because the infinity is open so this is what we understand as freedom but we need to understand this in this holistic concept and context to really um, um, utilize infinity and this creativity in a constructive fashion and last but not least when you when you are aware of this holistic uh, symmetry equation and know that infinity is included you can also understand that this harmony has a, a beauty that is radiating from within which is uh, which has no limit and this is also very uh, inspiring if you, if you have that in in your present in your consciousness and um, so I would like to quote Frank Wilczek uh, one more time or two times from his latest book the fundamentals he says I'd like to make a connection between the unified worldview and a moral attitude what what recommends it is its harmony and harmony of course is local symmetry with progress we have come to consider people and creatures as having intrinsic value and being worthy of profound respect just like ourselves this comes from the understanding that really every small unit is part of the whole and it is important so we have to realize that even the smallest microbe in the soil is important to generate healthy soil and of course this goes for plants and people in all aspects of reality as well and Wilczek also says those tasks of liberation and empathy are not separated from understanding the fundamentals of science indeed understanding helps us to achieve them and that's why I've been uh, discussing this local symmetry aspect <clears throat> and it refers back to what Ledermann and Hill said and also Einstein and at the end to close off this talk I want to give you two more quotes by Einstein with respect to this beautiful structure that nature is and in 1933 in his lecture on the method of theoretical physics Einstein said based on our experiences so far we have reason to be confident that nature is the realization of the simplest conceivable mathematical concept and also 
Uh, to, he once said to the Princeton High School reporter Henry Rousseau, as a boy of 12 years making my acquaintance with elementary mathematics, I became more and more convinced that even nature could be understood as a relatively simple mathematical structure. And uh, this concludes my talk for today. I hope you enjoyed it. You can always subscribe to my channel, activate the notification bell, which is spectacular fun. And I hope to see you next time. Bye bye.